Welcome to Peter Laszlo Perry, a Hungarian-born artist in Berlin and London, in our series, Flight of Fight, Stories of Artists Under Repression. I'm Rachel Stern, Director and CEO of the Fritz Usher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized, and Banned Art based in New York. We research, discuss, publish, and exhibit artists whose life and work were affected by the German Nazi regime between 1933 and 1945. Today, I'm honored to introduce two speakers. Lila Farkas, cultural attaché at the Liszt Institute of the Consulate General of Hungary in New York, will give introductory remarks. Ari Hartog is the director of the Gerhard Marx House in Bremen, Germany. He studied art history at the University of Nimwegen. His research focus is the history of sculpture in the 20th century. He's chairman of the Association of Sculpture Museums and Sculpture Collections and researches on the history of sculpture in the 20th century and the post posthumous further development of sculptural oeuvres of the so-called classic modernism. Publications are, among others, Hans Arp Sculptures, A Critical Inventory, Ostfildern Ruth, uh, 2012, and Mark Gunde, Ari Hartog, Frank Schmidt, um, editors of uh, Female Sculptures, Sculptors in Germany, Cologne 2019, and Prague Sculptures, Cologne 2022. After the talk, there will be time for Q&A, so please post your questions in the chat. Now I welcome Lila Farkas. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as the Cultural Attaché of Hungary in New York, I'm honored to welcome everyone at this conference about the genius artist um, Peter Laszlo Peri, titled Fight or Flight. My name is Lila Farkas and I represent today the Liszt Institute Hungarian Cultural Center, whose miss mission is to present and promote Hungarian arts and culture to New York City audiences. Fight and flight. Peri's life is captured by these two very much evocative words that reflect the life of many interwar immigrant artists. The hardships and trauma endured by these artists, many of them Hungarian, including Kepes, Brasai, or Munkachi, led to astounding works that transcended national borders. Yet uh, too often all we see in museums is a simple line, just a year, a nationality, and the name of the artist. Um, this conference attempts to look at the artist beyond the geographically limited perspective of national borders, as we always should. Peri's life is um, full of incredible twists and turns. As, and um, I would like to thank the uh, Fritz Asher Society, Rachel Stern in particular, and Ari Hartog for launching this niche initiative. I think the theme of the conference could not be more topical. While learning about Peri's life, I couldn't help but notice um, that his life and the influences he drew from, while completely unique, are comparable to similar trends that we see today. Peter Laszlo Peri was at first a constructivist artist, and only later, through his activism and involvement in socio-political issues, did he turn to figurative sculpture and painting. As a byproduct of pandemic isolation and Enforced solitude, I think a similar trend shift can be observed at the major, world's major art fairs and exhibitions. And we see many young artists once again returning to figurative themes. As he aptly wrote in 1962, art is made for the uh, benefit of the people. Human lives and their relationships to each other are not exhausted as a subject, nor will they ever be. New materials and new techniques are yet to be experimented with to express our lives in a new way. It is people who remain the main subjects of art because it is people who make history. Now, I am sure you are keen to learn more about Peri from the expert himself. And with that, I would like to give the world to uh, Ari Hartog, director of the Gerhard Marx House in Bremen to present his research on Peri. Thank you very much. 
Um, thank you. I will share my... Here we have something to see. Um, thank you, uh, Lila Farkas, for your remarks and Richard Stern for your introduction. And of course, for inviting me to present this small paper on Peter Laszlo Perry. Uh, when I prepared it and I started making slides, it grew bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I thought, well, oh, I have to do it in 40 minutes, so I'm going to try it. Uh, Perry was born 1899 as Laszlo Weiss from a Jewish family in Budapest, and he died 1967 in London. His father uh, adopted the Hungarified name Perry in 1918. In Hungary, after the end of the Habsburg Empire, German names, they disappeared very quickly. And um, the pressure on Jews with German names even seemed stronger. In Germany and Hungary, he is mostly known as Laszlo Perry, in the UK as Peter Perry, or as Peter Laszlo Perry, but it's all important to understand that it's one and the same. The German National Library, and this is very German bureaucratic, lists him under eight different names. And doing research on him, we found even more two variants. So we agreed on Peter Laszlo Perry, the name he himself preferred from 1950 on. In this paper, I will present some aspects of his biography, some works that are part of the exhibition that is now uh, in on display in Berlin and later on with us in Bremen some works we cannot show, and some new things we are working on. I will not go into chapters we have dealt with in this bilingual catalog, so this paper may be a reason for you to read it. Um, the next image. Our project developed from the so-called AG Bildhauer Museum, the working group of sculpture museums in Germany. It's an organization of 40 museums and bequests. And here the idea rose to do something about Perry. Who? Yes, Perry, this interesting exile artist who was in Berlin avant-garde circles in the early 1920s and later became a figurative sculptor in England. Kunsthaus Dahlem in Berlin is a relatively young museum. It is housed in the former studios of the famous and or infamous sculptor Arno Breker, Hitler's favorite. And from this history, my colleague Dorothea Schöne, who spoke to you earlier in other conferences, developed a concept that focuses on art that could develop once the guy was gone. On the one hand, post-war modernism, and on the other hand, this very strong interest in exiles. So for example, the Kunsthaus initiated an important exhibition on Yusuf Abel in 2019. The Gerhard Marx House in Bremen holds the bequest of the sculptor Gerhard Marx, whom you may all know as the maker of the Bremen town musician's bronze. And our focus is similar not so much on exiles, but on the history of modern sculpture and unknown artists. And as Marx started at the Bauhaus and became a figurative sculptor in, later in his life, we are very interested in artists who turned their back on avant-garde. We made this exhibition in close consultation with Peter Perry, the keeper of the artist's estate, his grandson, who is our main lender. Uh, now to Perry. Oh no, something different I have to tell you before we go to Perry. Because from my point of view, there is also something else we should talk about, and that is the strange history of communist art in the early 20th century. We know that a lot of artists sympathized with the Russian Revolution and Western art history has always had interest for those artists that had, on one hand, a leftish agenda and were aesthetically progressive. On the other hand, communist art history was just as selective and preferred those artists working in a clear socialist 
realist mode. But the interesting thing is, of course, that while we nowadays have a clear image of what socialist realism in the 1930s and 1940s looked like, mostly in Russia, the question is hardly ever asked how it developed, and secondly, whether there were alternatives. And Peter Laszlo Perry is a fantastic test case as he forces you, us, to think differently about all these categories that we use so easily. And it all has to do with biography and chance. Almost nobody nowadays knows, knows Heinz Tichauer. He's gone. He was killed and then removed from art history. But in the late 1920s, he was the chairman of the so-called ASSO, the Association Revolutionaire Bildender Künstler, the Association of Revolutionary Visual Artists. He made this non-heroic proletarian in 1929, and the city of Berlin bought it to present it in front of one of the railway stations. But that did not happen. Like Perry, he was a Jew, he was a communist, he was forced to leave Germany in 1933, and via Prague and Paris, he went to Moscow, where he was killed during the Stalinist purges of 1938. Similar things happened to quite some communist artists from Perry's circle. Some were as adaptive to survive the Soviet Union, the more creative, independent ones were killed. And Perry, he was lucky. He could emigrate to the UK thanks to his wife and became British citizen in 1939. For this Tichauer, I know of 10 works and only few have survived visually. Because when he was rehabilitated after Stalin's death, all traces had been removed, first by the Nazis and then by East German communists following Russian orders. And the point is that due to this, Tichauer, he's just an example, we have a strange void in German art history. We only know of communist art of the late 1920s that was compliant to East German art history. But there was more, and looking at Peter Laszlo Perry gives us a glimpse. So here he is. To the left, he is standing at the Sturm Gallery during his exhibition in 1922. He's standing next to one of his um, space constructions. And the interesting thing is, of course, the form of the carton. Works like this made Perry in the 1970s the inventor of the shaped canvas. And they called him a precursor of the American painter Frank Stella. The painting itself combines flatness and spatial illusion. And this is a topic we will find throughout his oeuvre. Look at the outline of the lower uh, part of the carton. And you will see how the vertical outline ends where the illusionistic block begins. So outline and image are linked in a way that was radically new as the, let me try to show you that we're talking about this outline then moving into the form. And that was radically new and Berlin critics in 1922 acknowledged it. On the other picture, you see him around 1932 working on a figurative sculpture. And here he has obviously left progressive abstract avant-gardism, but what he is making is not just simple figurative sculpture, but a work by which he is positioning himself in the discussion around 1930. And here we see a second problem to the missing communist sculpture of the 1920s, and that is this antagonism between abstraction and figurative art by which we are told that every figuration or all figuration is conservative. But this strange plump guy with folded arms has nothing to do with neither 
Berlin contemporary bourgeois sculpture, nor with heroic realism that evolved around these times. But let's start at the beginning. In Hungary, as far as we know, Perry started at a lawyer's office and then began, began an apprenticeship as a stonemason. This is important as this politically active man was a worker himself. And we always tend to think that stonemasons just hit stones, but working with concrete in the early 20th century was part of the job, which would become later on, uh, which would become important for him later on. He seems to have been active in leftish circles around the magazines Atet and Ma, worked in theater and participated in the Hungarian Soviet from March to August 1919. And after that, he had to leave the country and via Vienna and Paris, he turns up in Berlin in the circle of mentioned Herbert Walden around the Sturm, the famous periodical and gallery with close links to both the um, European avant-garde and the Soviet Union. Here, well, let's have a look if it works. No, thank you. Excuse me, technique doesn't work. Yes. Um, here you see an early drawing by Perry as it was published in Der Sturm. And it, of course, reminds one of Alexander Archipenko and his play with positive and negative space. And Archipenko was the main artist of Der Sturm, so that's the influence. The drawing in the middle is a step further, both when it comes to the triangle on the right side between the legs and the head, which is both a negative and a positive form, dependent on what you identify. And on the left, on the right side, you see a wood sculpture and words like this indicate that when Perry arrived in Berlin, he was working in a, let's call it, Archipenko-influenced form of expressionism, which was not very up to date. But then in 1922, he turned to constructivism and became a forerunner. Here you see the portfolio of linoleum prints, the Sturm published in 1923. And there are two ways of looking at these motives. The first would underline the relationship between flatness and space. There's always a hint of perspective, but it's never defined. So you might think of an artist interested in overlapping perspectives, but digging into the sources, you will also find complete different second context and that is Berlin and Vienna-based Hungarian avant-garde. One of the ideas promoted by Piri's friend, Lajos Kasak, was what he called built architecture, to be translated as the architecture of the picture. He advocated an anti-illusionist concept of the image, and rather than receding into perspectival depth, the painting should move into the space forward on the strength of its unmistakably identical parts in a clear arrangement. And when you read it with Kasak, you think, oh, sounds good, but how to do it? And the impression one gets is that um, Perry is trying to. And another friend of Perry's, Kalai, established a direct link between constructive form and social content. He said that if you distribute all pictorial elements equally over the plane, that is the representation of a social political aspiration. So this although you would not see it directly, is socialist art from this, well, Hungarian avant-garde perspective. And socialism meant obedience to Moscow. 
Pyrrhian friends, they agitated against what they called bourgeois constructivism with their own constructivism based on communist principles, which would become art, they said, as collective architecture in the future. That was, of course, their hope. And for this cause, they thought it absolutely self-evident that any working artist would, sub uh, would subordinate personal interests to the, those of the proletarians. So personal style was never the issue. That's a look. On the space construction to the right, you will see a hint of foreshortening in the table. But is it a table? Or is it a simplified depiction of reality? Or did Perry already play with human perception? There is a strong hint in contemporary theory, but no proof yet, as written sources are rare. The Hungarian constructivists argued that no element within a composition should be subordinate to others, a kind of communism on a flat plane, which is a thought you will find with other constructivists, constructivists also. And until 1924, this style was, of course, a modernist style used by Soviet propaganda in the West, Berlin being the capital of this. The whole idea was that there was something like bourgeois constructivism, that was the Dutch, and on the other hand, you had a socialist uh, constructivism, and that this is a discussion that when we read it nowadays, uh, is very strange to us, but it explains uh, part of what has happened. This idea of an equilibrium of visual means becomes even more clear when you start to compare, and this is just an example, the outlines of forms Perry used. And you get the impression that there might even be a geometric pattern behind it. On the left, you see two versions of one composition and the link between the print and the painting is important here. Freestanding motives were nothing new for wood or linoleum cuts, but they were still printed on a piece of paper. But Perry wanted them to be objects for themselves. And therefore, when it comes to the portfolio I showed you earlier, all forms were not just printed, but they were even cut out and glued on the paper to make that difference visible. Here are two images, two posters. And this is one of the intriguing things about um, Perry. The one is um, a poster that was used in March, 1921, when it came to the, when the um, German Communist Party tried to stage a revolution. And this poster is a clear hint that um, Perry was working as a revolutionary at that point. The other is a image in a arts magazine, but it's the same kind of meaning. Two different styles, but it's both about the proletarians who will prevail. And um, the very moment you start looking at an artist like this, you see that on the one hand, you have his work that we see nowadays as autonomous work. And on the other hand, you see works that can be put within a very clear political propaganda, um, well, context. And this image or these two images remind us that we might think about those two together and not try to divide. Here you see as a another two posters on the right from Perry from 1924. And on the other hand, where that motives 
comes from, because we are talking about 1924, constructivism is mostly over, and now artists pick up the so-called proletkult from the early 1910s, so the heroic kind of worker, and that is uh, a very interesting uh, change in his work. Perry also worked as a cartoonist, and over the last month I have found quite a lot, but we know that a lot of the drawings and prints that were made for communist papers were anonymous and or collective, and they were mostly non signed. So finding those cartoons is not um, easy. And here you see, I think, the final twitch of constructivism. It's the design for a Lenin monument from 1924, an image Adolf Bene, who was a Berlin art critic and a close friend of um, Perry, included it in his famous book on modern architecture, the Moderne Zweckbau. And I think it's very important to understand that Bene was a friend, and because of that, he included this fantastic idea into a book on modern utilitarian architecture. I mean, it's a, it's just a kind of a fantasy and um, it's probably the most famous image from um, Perry. At this time, we know that he started working as a um, architect. And that is, of course, something we see with a lot of uh, avant-garde-ish artists in Germany who have been working in a constructivist mode in the early 1920s, and then they move from the painting towards the um, architecture. Also out of the idea that they want to have a direct impact into society. We should, when discussing an artist like Perry, and I think this is something you will find with a lot of exile uh, artists, is that from an art historical point of view, active communists are rather hard to find as they were mostly living on the ground. So in Perry's case, there is hardly any mentioning of him in the address books, only once. And then he calls himself a stone mason. We know where he lived in Siemensstadt, but if you then look into the address books, nobody was listed. So we have a staircase, six parties without any name. So probably people were living there who did not want to be found or listed. But on the other hand, we have some sources, and I think it's important to always realize um, that what you are, what we are actually doing, um, because this is what Germans call the needle in the haystack, but nonetheless with some results. Um, we have an envelope where he states his studio, Tempelhof, Kaiser Wilhelmstraße. Then if you go into the address books, uh, you will find that at the time in 1930, when that card was uh, sent or that envelope was sent in the address book on that address, uh, there is one, um, on the bottom uh, left, painter, Akademischer Maler, uh, Horst Michel. Um, and the interesting thing is that was also, we now know, a communist who later became quite famous in the GDR. So you get some ideas of a network that was uh, in Berlin. In 1932, he made an exhibition in this studio that was reviewed, but never advertised. So obviously it was for an inner circle of communist intellectuals discussing the future of communist aesthetics. And while such a discussion was impossible in Moscow at that time, it could be done in Berlin. If you then go into this, and I will not go into 
too deep, you will find that what Perry is doing at that time is he is presenting different modes. On the one hand, um, a way of depicting nudes that is not in the way in the way of that German um, sculpture at that time depicts uh, salon-like nice nude figures elegantly. He, he makes it ex very plump. In the middle, you see the idea of depicting the life of a work of the, of the working class, a uh, woman, uh, a washing woman. And on the right, you see the, the concept of a heroic art of the, um, well, uh, proletarian masses. Of course, the guy is standing on a red star. So that is the, the kind of way you could interpret what we know of Perry in the uh, early 1930s of his work. And the interesting thing is, um, we do not have many works, but we have quite some photographs of his works and thereby he's one of the artists where we can say quite a lot about the discussion at that time. What is um, absolutely incredible is the collection of drawings from the bequest that came to the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds. We have them not on display in Berlin or Bremen, but it would be worth a exhibition because these drawings show on the one hand, uh, an artist who was constantly making drawings. Obviously he was always using any kind of paper he had to not down small observations. And on the other hand, there's always this kind of play with how can one make this into an image for propaganda, propaganda means. The image to the right shows this interesting idea of how to transfer a human figure into a star, of course, a red star. And then in around 1932, Perry, discovered concrete. Like I said, as a stonemason, he knew the material and he knew what that communist artists saw it as appropriate. It was not bourgeois, it was not bronze, it was not marble, but it was a material of our times. So to the left, you see a sculpture of Lucy Pusok Jian that was cast in concrete. She was a Dresden communist working in this material by casting it. But Perry already at this, this time started modeling it and he developed a technique for making reliefs. And I think that we should not underestimate the proletarian factor of this technique because making such a piece in concrete is absolutely dirty work. And the complete opposite of the bourgeois academic making a model and having it transferred into other materials. In March 1933, shortly after the Nazis seized power and the, their terror against communists reached a new peak, Perry and his second wife, Mary McNachten, were able to leave Germany and emigrated to London. As far as we can reconstruct, he became one of the founders of the Artists International Association, the AIA, the leading left-wing artist organization in England. So his political agenda went on and on. In 1936 came Perry's first solo exhibition from constructivism to realism at the Foyer Gallery. And from there on, you have different exhibitions, especially in the late 1930s. And here he is then being presented in a new context as the artist who has finally solved the antagonism between abstract and figurative art. Because 
especially when you have a look at the piece in the middle, you could argue, well, it's figurative, but it is, have, he has learned from avant-garde. So the um, industry also becomes interested. In uh, 1938, he presented his exhibition, London Life in Concrete in Soho Square, and in, his showed his first sculptures in colored cement. And this exhibition was, remind you, he is a communist, sponsored by the Cement and Concrete Association, which also commissioned the artist with a large format wall piece for its boardroom. So pity, sorry, that this one has not survived. Um, so he was now modeling with concrete, not as a material for the a Marxist point of view, but more as a material of modernity. And from this on, he would develop his own technique and even um, invent a new word, pericrete, on the one hand, peri, on the other hand, concrete. But he still has this very strong political agenda, as you can see. For some reason or another, my there he is. This is his sculpture of Stalin in he made in 1942, which is a fantastic piece. Um, as you can imagine, looking at this sculpture that the Russian embassy did not want to have it. It is a form of realism, but it's absolutely not the form of heroic realism that you will find at that time um, in the um, Soviet Union. And um, sometimes it's on display at um, Tate uh, Britain, and it's a fantastic, uh, strange, kind of portrait on the one hand, trying to make this political into the visionary that Perry obviously thought he was. And on the other hand, uh, not trying to do this in a naturalistic way. In the 1950s, early 1950s, he then starts making these small, absolutely brilliant reliefs. Uh, some of them are on display now in Berlin, where he actually, where you really have this idea that what was told about his work in the 1930s, that he is combining things from constructivism and figura figuration uh, comes to a complete new level when it's on the one hand, a diving board, on the other hand, you see the shadow and it's in itself a form, a relief on the wall. And um, this was um, something that was absolutely new at that time. And it's very intriguing uh, that it was hardly received. There's very little mentioning of people having seen this and saying, wow, now that's interesting. And that, of course, has to do with the same mechanism that we see a lot with communist artists, that is that they are being... Uh, perceived within their circles, but the art market, in a broader sense, neglects them. In 1948, he then suggests to London County, uh, County Council that um, a new built social housing in Lambeth should be enhanced with wall sculpture. And he said he would go and do it directly in wet concrete. These are art uh, in architecture objects which are still uh, existing today. And they uh, paved the path or the way for a whole series of 
commissions for public spaces in various places in England, including Leicestershire, Rochester, and Yorkshire. Perry said in a very intriguing article, and this is something uh, that was related uh, referred to earlier, he said, well, um, sculpture has lost its function within modern society, and we should get back to this traditional connection between sculpture and um, architecture. He wrote an article on that, um, which I will now not quote, but the his argument was that clients no longer saw sculpture as an integral element of architecture, but as something additional, perhaps even inessential. And that clients, so Perry argued, uh, thought that it inflated the costs of a building project. And he said his sculpture should be seen as the possible alternative. On the one hand, it depicts modern society, bridges the gap between art and society. And on the other hand, he makes the sculpture in the material that was also used for the building. So it's not more, nothing, you know, added on, which is an interesting idea that he says, well, I am not the sculptor who's coming with an extra piece of work. No, I am the sculptor who is working within the context of all the other workers who are making this building. And in the 19... 1955, 1956, he starts working with uh, synthetic resin and combinations of concrete and polyester. And from that, he developed the idea of also something quite new, diagonal sculptures on modern buildings with often a very simple kind of symbolism, but it must have been very impressive. Here you see uh, an example. And this is uh, the next photo I liked so much where the children come underneath that sculpture. And you must think how that must have worked to have such a giant sculpture um, on a wall. Here you see other ones. And the problem with the material is that it's very difficult uh, to maintain. So a lot of these works have been um, destroyed, which is absolutely a pity. Um, around this time, and it's probably better to have a look at this piece, around this time, Perry became, became a Quaker. And he also became known for his graphic cycle, The Pilgrim's Progress. And what's interesting here is that he was an artist who was always very much into technique, both in his etchings and in his sculptures. He had a very strong identity of not only being able to do something, but also to be inventive. But that would be a complete different paper. And now my last slide is, I think, the most important work of his later career, and we cannot show it as it cannot be moved. And that is the so-called Coventry sculpture made for the new museum in that city. And if you are there, you should go there and have a look because this is the work where Perry obviously tried to combine his figurative sculpture with a system of non-hierarchical presentation as had been the goal of his early abstract works. So the very moment you dig into this artist, you will find that while there are very different styles, there is a political, social attitude and some absolutely striking constants in the work of Laszlo Perry. So he's a Hungarian sculptor who sequentially lived in Berlin and London, and he gives us an important hint that we should think again about where art, sculpture, and communist aesthetics stood in Germany before 1933, and how it was then able to develop further 
In doing so, I think it might confirm Robert Burstow's thesis in our book that Perry attempted an alternative socialist realism that did not fall back to 19th century, but took on all the achievements of modernism. And for me, it's, of course, very interesting that this synthesis of, on the one hand, uh, the, uh, modernism and avant-garde constructivism and figura figuration that was discussed in the GDR around 1960. Then there, it was dismissed by the Communist Party, and then afterwards it was shelved. And in England, it was able to develop because Perry went there and could do it. That's not an irony of history, but a remarkable fact that art history, I think, has to acknowledge. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ari. This this was fabulous and um, uh, very, very rich. And thank you for sharing your, your new research. Um, I want to ask everyone, please, to put your questions in the chat function or in the Q&A. Um, and I want to start right away with, you know, talking about England, starting from the end, uh, wondering whether um, the context in which Perry created and showed his work, whether that was uh, also a um, communist worker oriented uh, context or did he leave that and did uh, 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 like what was the context he was in in England? Well, the interesting thing is, of course, that the very moment he comes to the uh, UK, uh, the people who are interested in him are uh, people like the art historian Anthony Blunt, who is known as a communist and uh, so it started there and then in in the 1940s um he obviously has um this very strong idea after this destruction there are two or three texts that you might interpret in this way after the destruction uh, also in uh, in london that he uh, thinks he has to contribute mm -hmm. uh, he still uh, within this uh, very strong communist mode. And mm -hmm. as far as I can see, the networks are still very similar. Mm -hmm. But that is uh, one of the things that should be, uh, well, um, I think should be examined uh, much more closely. Because what I did earlier, uh, what I showed you about the Berlin networks, mm -hmm. um, well, to be very honest, that's the thing what interests me. And that's what I've been a lot of research on. And I, I do hope, uh, and I do know that a lot of my English colleagues have done quite some research on these networks in the UK. But the interesting thing is then, if you read their papers, uh, Perry is often missing, missing. So you think, where is he? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And um, uh, from what I understand, his second wife was also uh, she was english uh and she was also communist right uh, so um i'm wondering whether he kind of joined the family and the context that she came from or whether they no. you know no, no 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 definitely not it, it is we are talking about an artist who had a very strong uh very strong political views and obviously chose partners who had the same strong mm -hmm. political views. Okay, yeah. Um, so Laurel is asking, was the Stalin one piece made in 42 or 1930? 42, sorry. If I said 30, that was wrong. It was 42. And it's, of course, this this whole idea that uh, comes up in the, in the early 1940s. We're in this together fighting um, the Nazis. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, can you tell us more about the cartoons by Perry that you have found? Are there abstract elements to them? No, 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 no. They they are very much in a um, in a kind of a standard 
uh, mode of the of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and if he had not signed them, you would not recognize that it's him. There are uh, there are about five or six cartoonists we know by name that were working, for example, uh, Rotefana and uh, some other uh, newspapers. But we also know that they made drawings together, mm -hmm. or they were discussing drawings. Like here, I saw it, and I, they gave it to the other ones. But mm -hmm. we have a few cartoons that are um, signed by Perry. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, they, but from an art historical point of view. They uh, they are they are not you know aesthetically um, exciting. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> but from a cultural historical point of view, they are very exciting. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Nicole is asking: Did uh, their art influence Dr. Seuss? You know Dr. Seuss, right? The um, uh, you, he wrote you a see lot by of... my expression that I'm uh, I do not know yet. No. So that's an American thing, I guess. Uh, and so I I think uh, we would ask uh, have to ask a Dr. Seuss expert because he uh, fled also from from Europe and mm -hmm. became in America well known for children's books. Ah, okay. Um, so the the yeah. Who were Paris contemporaries in Britain at the time, and who may have claimed that? Perry inspired them. Um, that's uh, that's an inter that's an interesting thing. Um, nobody has ever said that Perry inspired them, but we know from uh, there are two or three remarks uh, of friends who were not sculptors uh, that he was somebody who was very willing to let people into his studio. So mm -hmm. probably a lot of people knew him, mm -hmm. and knew what he was doing. But it's not like I mean contemporaries Hepworth Moore that kind of sculptors. But it's it's not like there is so there's this very broad field of um, sculptors at that time. But mm -hmm. I do not know. Um, I would have to look. There are some remarks of younger sculptors who say, "Well, we've we've been with Perry, and he was this was interesting," but mm -hmm. not much more than that. It's not in the way that you can say, "Well, this is an artist who is clearly uh, inspired mm -hmm. others." Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean these these uh architectural uh, figures uh on the buildings they must have yes. uh you know inspired a lot of people because they are so absolutely unusual. Yes, uh, yes. That I think But every sculptor, but every sculptor who sees that probably thinks how how to do that. Yeah. How can you do it? <laughs> Yeah. And obviously, Perry has solved it, but how he solved it, he took, you know, the secret into his grave. Oh, okay, yeah. That's too unfortunate, actually. Yes. But you also said they were not, they are not so durable. So, um, uh, yeah, maybe that held people back from, from learning from him also. Yes. Um, Laurel is asking, what prompted Perry to become a Quaker? Good question. Was he, um, was he a religious person? Was he? Did he have a Jewish? I don't know. I don't know. One one of the inter one of the interesting things of Perry is that we know very little um, of the man himself. He he wrote a few texts. Most of the things we know of him and of his life, we know from an interview that his second wife gave in the nineteen eighties. Mm -hmm. So that is from memory. So it's there is of course truth in that, but it's also um, not. Um, it's it's also difficult to use it um, as a precise kind of source. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that um, there is probably the idea of a just and equal society uh, that mm -hmm. is plays a big role within uh, within the Quaker um, religious um, ideas uh, was interesting for him. Mm -hmm. That would be my impression. And I do not have the, I do not know, but I have not checked the resources uh, or the sources on that. I think that even after he became a Quaker, he still was in the other, you know, his political uh, positions they mm -hmm. have not changed 
Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. So, and that, uh, did that influence the family uh, somehow? The, the, I don't know. I'm, don't I'm, know. I'm, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, this is the time when he went into that religion. Uh, that was the time when he divorced from his second wife. So that may have played a role, but we do not know. And I am not the guy who's going to speculate on that. <laughs> that is good. <laughs> uh, um, so somebody gives you contacts. Um, okay. Uh, I was wondering actually about the the influence of the Bauhaus because you mentioned that for other artists that surrounded um, uh, Perry in Berlin, the the Bauhaus was was important and the ideas that Bauhaus uh, taught uh, and promoted. Um, can you? Well, it's more. It's, there's more kind of um, a it's parallel lines. Um, he was a friend of uh, uh, of Moholy Notch. Mm -hmm. uh, they exhibited together at the storm, and then the very moment when Moholy Notch leaves, you know, the idea of painting and starts work, goes towards the Bauhaus, is the, the moment when Perry uh, goes towards architecture. So it's a it's a similar kind of um, history, and mm -hmm. which you will find with a lot of avant-garde-ish artists in the early nineteen twenties that they move from you know art towards architecture as they are uh, convinced that architecture uh, has uh, a bigger impact mm -hmm. on the world than a painting mm -hmm. yeah and not mixing disciplines though right um really pretty depends, much dep depends on the artist that's uh, right. that's the next paper you can invite me for <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, was Perry's income solely from his art or did he supplement it with other work well in the 1920s you get the impression that he uh, had a kind of a mixed income mm -hmm. and that mixed income comes from the one part from or most part from the his work as uh, within uh, propaganda, mm -hmm. then uh, he works, uh, the very moment it gets difficult, he works as a stonemason. Mm -hmm. And we do not have the impression that he sold too much, not that he sold as much as that he could live from it. He may have sold, but not many. We know that there are some works, the, the second wife in her memory says that he has sold a few pieces to a famous collector. But that's about it. So that's not something where he could live from. Later on, he was able to, um, in England, especially the public programs where he was working in, uh, that enabled him uh, to live also from his art. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, there is a very long question, Susan says. Yeah. Thank you for this wonderful talk. I have two somewhat marginal questions. I was struck by the linoleum prints, 1922-23, uh, for that storm. How they, like his other work, seem to vacillate between flatness and dimensionality. Some of these shapes made me think also of the swastika. Was the a swastika developed, uh, no, it was not around yeah. that time. Yeah. It's a yeah. pretty ancient uh, form, actually. Was there some aesthetic political relationship between these forms of propaganda? Um, yeah, so we'll okay. stay with that first. Well, that is the interesting idea. One of the ideas is that these uh, images that are on the one hand flat, on the other hand, they give the indicate some kind of perspective, but that perspective is very in, uh, undefined. Mm -hmm. um, could have a kind of political meaning. Mm -hmm. That is one of the and the very moment you go into uh, you know Hungarian constructivist theory, you will find all kinds of ideas that are about you know the painting should not be not you know recede into a virtual space 
but the mm -hmm. painting should all, only be as or the image should only be on the flat plane and all these kinds of um, concepts play a role there and these theorists uh, combined that or they said that if you do that you're a real socialist well okay <laughs> let's believe it <laughs> um the work is in such great condition who has restored it so well I think that's especially about the concrete uh, figures and the, you know, the... Yes, the, yes. Well, yeah. the, the uh, when it comes to the concrete works, they have been, uh, the pieces I showed you, they are in the exhibition now, and they have been restored over the years uh, by uh, the estate. Mm -hmm. And they are in a, in, a, in, a, in a good condition, yes, absolutely. Very good. And, and the thing is, of course, uh, I mean, Perry, he knew what he was doing. Mm -hmm. So uh, using this very difficult material and any kind of conservator can tell you horror stories about concrete, um, mm -hmm. but he knew quite well what he was doing. That helps a lot. <laughs> um, last question, um, um, because Perry left, was Jewish and left uh, and uh, left Europe. Do you know what happened to his family? Um, were they also communists? Did they uh, did they survive? We, the war? We, uh, I do not know the the, the family uh, history by detail, uh, but mm -hmm. I know that uh, some of the family members were killed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, this is a very exciting talk I want to mention, and I will also send that out in the follow-up email, um, uh, that uh, uh, information about your exhibition, um, because Peter Laszlo Perry, Perry's People, is now on view at the Kunsthaus Dahlem in Berlin until January 28th. And at the Gerhard Marx House in Bremen from March 10 until June 2nd, uh, 2024. And there is also an, a catalog that accompanies that exhibition. Um, and I will send out the link for that as well. So thank you very much, um, Adi Hertog, and also Lila Farkas. This was a very interesting uh, um journey into into an artist's work that um i i think most of us weren't familiar with and uh thank you so much for introducing it to to us all thank you you're welcome